This Week in Radio Tech, episode 295 is brought to you by Lavo and the Crystal Clear Virtual Radio Console. Crystal Clear is the console with a multi-touch touchscreen interface. By the full line of Zipstream audio processors and stream encoders. Stream like you mean it with Zipstream. And by the Axia Radius IP Audio Console. Affordable, beautiful, and powerful. Only Axia connects to so much so easily. Could antennas be lurking all around you? Chris Tobin says it's happening more than you might imagine. From office buildings to hospitals and stadiums to convention centers, distributed antenna systems are popping up in walls, ceilings, and on light poles everywhere. Engineering these systems requires precision planning and field testing. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. I'm so delighted to be here. Of course I'm delighted to be here. Look, look at where I am. Holy cow. Uh, I'm broadcasting to you uh, live, more or less, from the uh, Rio Palace, Las Americas, in Cancun, Mexico, or Mexico, as it might properly be pronounced. Uh, yeah, the, the, the Rio Palace is at Rio Palace. This is absolutely beautiful. And uh, no, they didn't get paid. To, I didn't get paid to say that. I'm just staying here, just a normal paying guest and uh, on vacation. But, you know, we weren't able to join you live last week. Uh, I was terribly ill and I was in Dubai. So it was two o'clock in the morning for me. So in the end, uh, hey, it's hard to do when you're healthy. In the end, we decided to scrap the show uh, kind of toward the last minute. But coming to you live this week, Chris Tobin joins me, and he has got a fantastic subject that I want to learn more about. I know a little bit about, but Chris is really going to fill us in on this. Uh, hey, Chris, welcome in. How are you? From uh, Are you at an undisclosed location, or can you I'm tell at a radio station, a radio station in Newark, New Jersey, in their tech operations center. My plan was uh, to be elsewhere to demonstrate some stuff, but uh, that'll have to go to another show. But yeah, I, I, it's warm outside. It's 61 degrees Fahrenheit, but I'm sure it's nothing like what you're experiencing from what I can see. And your video, even though you may be bandwidth limited or challenged, looks very good and quite uh, inviting. I think it's about 87 degrees and 187% humidity here today. <laughs> so I can yesterday deal with that. we had a. <laughs> yeah. You know, they say it's like that, like this every day or almost every day. I don't know that I could actually deal with this every single day. It's. It, Oh, blue skies and puffy white clouds and perfect sailing weather, if you're into that, beach weather. Um, I'm at a hotel that's just absolutely fabulous. It's a, one of these all-inclusives. Uh, my, you know, my wife said, let's go to an all-inclusive. So, you know, here, here we are. But the subject of radio and broadcasting just never seems to uh, leave my mind, no matter where I go. So we're going to talk about uh, some interesting uh, antenna systems. In the promo for today's show, I said, hey, you are probably around this stuff and you don't even know it. You've probably used these antenna systems and you don't even know it. And so what we're talking about is uh, a technology called IDAS or ODAS, Indoor Distributed Antenna Systems and Outdoor Distributed Antenna Systems. And hey, you may think you know about this stuff, but I did some research and I found out a ton of stuff that I didn't know. So I'm sure Chris will fill us in on more stuff that uh, even as an engineer, I really didn't know was out there and didn't know how this stuff works. So we'll get to that in just a minute, moment. Our show is brought to you in part, in part by the folks at Lavo. Lavo, L-A-W-O, at Lavo.com. They make audio consoles, and typically they make these great big consoles, but Lavo also makes a radio console. It's the Crystal series, and part of that series is the Crystal Clear audio console. This console is, uh, well, you know, the heart of it is a one-rack unit box that goes in a rack, and that's where you plug your audio inputs and outputs to. That's where it has its uh, dual redundant power supplies. That's where it has the network connection that speaks Ravenna or AES-67, so it'll talk to plenty of other devices on the market and those coming out of the market. But, of course, that's the heart of the console. What about the part that you use? What about the part that the... The disc jockey, the operator, the RJ, as they call them in India and other parts of the world. What do they touch? Well, it's a multi-touch touchscreen monitor. It's, it's the console is flat and it's right in front of you and it's as big or as little a monitor as you want, uh, but it's absolutely gorgeous. And because it's all done in software, every bit of it, uh, the console is extraordinarily intuitive. It's even context sensitive to what you're doing or it's contextually aware. 
So if you push uh, an on-off button for a microphone, well, of course, this turns the microphone on and off. But if you push the options button for the same microphone, then what happens is uh, you get the options for that source, for a microphone, for example. If you need to set the mic preamp gain, well, you just touch this button and you can set the mic preamp gain. You can set EQ and you can set other um, aspects that would be appropriate for setting up a microphone. So it's really terrific the way that that works. Faders are huge. They're big. You can run them up and down easily with your fingers. And uh, it's just really a fantastic console idea. It's a multi-touch touch screen, so you can actually put all 10 fingers on the console and move these faders up and down at the same time. Even the monitor and the headphone faders, you can move up and down. Uh, they're, they're linear faders, so you can move them up and down easily with your hand. You don't have to try to twist a knob that's actually on a screen. So they designed it to be a touchscreen console. Check it out if you would at Lavo, L-A-W-O dot com. Check out the Lavo Crystal Clear. Now, explaining it much better than I just have, Mike Dosh has done a video that explains the Lavo Crystal Clear console. It's right in the upper right-hand corner of that uh, web page. There you go. And, and you can just click on that uh, thumbnail and watch Mike's about a 10-minute explanation of how the Lavo Crystal Clear console works. Thanks a lot to Lavo for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. Okie dokie, Chris. You suggested this topic, ODAS and IDAS. And you know what, Chris? At first, I thought you were talking about leaky coax, and I found out that there's a lot more to this than leaky coax. So why don't you give us a little introduction to uh, this topic of IDAS and ODAS? All right, well... Uh so IDAS and ODAS, it's DAS basically is the technology or the, the, the concepts, which is distributed antenna systems. So if you have recently been in New York City and traveled on the New York City subway system, you would have noticed that your cell phone was working fine. You were able to do Wi-Fi or cell service, either one, and you were able to stay connected on the grid, if you will, even though you're below ground. And that was uh, because of the distributed antenna system technologies, which is if you can think of in terms of uh, taking an antenna, ca a, a, a splitter, and you split out your antenna line. So think of like the days of cable boxes in your studio. You'd take a splitter and split the cable box to several locations. Well, in place, replace the cable box with an antenna. The splitter is, is just what it is, an RF splitter. And then the source is, say, a signal from the outside. So what they would call a donor, a donor, a donor uh, antenna, brings in the signal, gets split, and brought into other antennas amplified through a bidirectional amplifier, because it's two-way, and then throughout the building. That's the early days of the very simple, simplistic method of distributed antenna systems. Fast forward to cellular technology needs, and now you've got what they call um, a fiber distribution remote unit. You have the fiber head end distribution. You have what's called a bidirectional amplifier slash repeater. You have also um, various other different boxes. They're just different names for basically different ways of distributing signal. Until and five o'clock. What's that? Oh. So in an office building, you can have your distributed antenna system all throughout uh, each floor. So you have an antenna on each floor. You have uh, fiber going between the floors, and it goes back to a base A station or a central unit. And now what's happening is cell companies, or wireless companies, are bringing fiber to a building and distributing their system that way. There are some places where they take the signal off the air. So say uh, there's, I was in a place in Florida where they t had an antenna system on the rooftop of a building pointing at a cell site, whatever, a particular cell, and brought that cell signal into the building and then distributed it throughout the building and created a, we'll call it a micro cell, and off you go. And that's what's going on. So the reason I bring this topic to the table today and we talk about it, and we, we'll probably talk some more over the next couple of months, is as broadcasters, how many times you go to a venue, and we'll use a sports bar as, as, as an example, that's part of a, say, a shopping mall complex, or maybe it's in an arena. Well, believe it or not, these distributed antenna systems are now becoming part of the infrastructure for wireless because it helps them offload the traffic from their main network of cell sites outside the arena and puts it in a focused location they can control and manage. So you can now go to a site, take your wireless, uh, say, data modem, and set it up, and now you may be 50 feet from the entry point into the wireless network. So you can get full bandwidth, full everything, whatever you pay for, and not have to worry about fighting six other different people because you're the closest one. And you're in a system that's been designed to handle the traffic that's expected at a stadium. How cool is that? So, so um, I was looking at, at the...
you know, there's there's different ways to do this IDAS and ODAS, and where where leaky cable actually can be part of it. Now, some of it is, um, you know, of course, with individual antennas and points. And maybe Chris, maybe you can take us a bit more through uh, the New York City subway system and what they've done there. Um, but it's, you know, there were some early systems that were done with simply one transmitter receiver and a leaky coax system, maybe through a building, so you'd have uh, uh, you'd be able to access the leaky coax that way. It transmits and receives. And they even designed leaky coax to um, not have the characteristics where it's strong near the transmitter and weak at the end, but it actually maintains a fairly constant uh, sensitivity or loss uh, throughout the whole system, no matter where you are. Um, they're also, uh, uh, and, and a lot of these leaky coax systems were designed for uh, mining. So they'd have you know the leaky coax go down the coal mine or whatever it was they were mining, and uh, and let them have you know two-way radio communications throughout that way. Um, these also been have been used in tunnel systems to get cellular and uh, radio stations in through a, lo a lengthy tunnel. Then we have the active systems where you have um, uh, uh, distributed antenna systems where you actually have a node, if you will, on say every floor of a multi-story building. And this way, you can reach deep into the into the the, the, the building. So you can have first responder communications. You can have Wi-Fi. You can have cellular, uh, all appearing deep in inside the building. And then, Chris, I'm sorry if I'm if I'm uh, repeating anything that you'd already said. Um, what I found particularly interesting, Chris, was these systems have tend to have a central base station. Uh, may typically be in the basement or a tech center in a, a given building or a stadium or other or a convention center. And then um, they use fiber to distribute the the broadband signal both directions to the different uh, to different floors or different sectors, if you will, whether it's a stadium or whether it's a multi-floor building. And then on each floor, they'll have a device that turns the RF or rather the, the radio signals that are represented in the fiber signal back into RF run that either into one or more antennas or through leaky coax on that floor or in that area. And then um, you have, as you said, you have the antennas much, much closer uh, to the people who are being served, the, the, uh, the, uh, the people with, with the small handheld radios, uh, Wi-Fi, tablets, whatever it, it may be. So, um, Chris, why don't you, you elaborate some on, on uh, some of the systems that you're familiar with? I'd love to hear more about the, the system that's been being installed still at the New York City subway. Yeah, I, I don't have the article with me, but I have a, an article that actually describes how they're doing the New York City subway system. And they, they did the block diagrams and the various nodes. And yes, there are systems, there's technology available that's used all the time. Matter of fact, if you do walk through Grand Central Terminal in New York City or New York uh, Penn Station, New York City, there, and uh, occasionally, in a New York Penn, I know it happens a lot, they're doing a lot of uh, construction and renovation. So from, from time to time, these ceiling tiles are open. And if you take a quick peek inside, you'll actually see the fiber to RF converter boxes that are made by a lot of different companies. So they actually take RF, and it goes into a, a converter, uh, and then converts it to fiber to light. And then they take that fiber and, and distribute it accordingly. So that's what helps to make these systems work so well. Because as we know, propagation along coax and the loss factors involved, it could get really, really messy. Because then you have to start doing amplifiers, you have to do you know, multi-couplers, and, uh, and all kinds of things that just get it gets crazy. So the systems now being deployed are fiber to each floor, if you will, or each or zone, and then they convert back to RF to make it to the person's or the subscriber unit, as it's known, the technology, and uh, that's what's going on. Leaky coax is still in use, though. Uh, in the cases of in uh, transit, you will see leaky coax along the tunnels, sometimes outdoors. It's still used for the RF two-way communications on the VHF or UHF frequencies. In, um, but it's the cellular stuff. It's distributed antenna systems that you'll see. And we have, I have three pictures I'm going to show uh, that show it two that are a method of testing to, to, to figure out how the distributed antenna system makes sense and the guys I talked to I, I can't say who it was because they're under contract and it's just they just they had no idea that I actually I actually understood what they were doing so they started talking to me and then realized oh wait a minute we shouldn't be talking to you um, they were testing the outside or outdoor distributed antenna system for a local for a local wireless company so that they can put these systems on lamp posts 
And the reason they want to do that is they want to create these microcells so that they can offload traffic and not have to have huge cell sites on building rooftops or side of the buildings, but put them on lampposts around areas and create these pockets where they can control it and, and, and allow penetration to buildings much easier. Because a lamppost is what? 10, 15 feet from a building, sidewalk length, you know, width, whereas a cell site may be several blocks yeah. away. So, you know, that's what they, and I was fascinated when I said, oh, interesting. And the method they use to test it and what they have to go through, which involves GPS, spectrum analyzers, and software that maps out RF measurements. And remember, in cell sites, on cellular phones, you have two frequencies involved. Okay, there's two channels. There's the upload, or the uplink, and then the downlink. So when they're doing these testing, the test measurements, they have to transmit two signals simultaneously from an antenna. And I'll show the picture. And then they drive around and map uh, the, uh, the RF signal and, and see where the, it, it rises and, low and goes up and down and, and what makes sense. And they can figure out the necessary uh, power levels required to make the receivers work and the transmitters work. So the cell phone, which is microwatts, is, uh, is able to operate in the system. You know, Chris, what I'm curious about learning is we know that there are laws of physics that, that can't be broken. And as engineers, we've dealt with uh, combiners, maybe uh, diplexers, duplexers. Um, we've, as, as ham radio operators, perhaps we've dealt with a system that would allow an, an antenna to transmit and receive at the same time at a repeater site, for example. And we're typically at, you know, at, at the, in the 440 megahertz band, you know, we're five megahertz apart typically. Uh, in the 144 megahertz band, what, how, what are we, 800 kilohertz apart typically for send and, and, and receive uh, RF. I'm curious as to how they miniaturize these diplexers uh, and, you know, I'm sure the same laws of physics apply, but I see these frames uh, in these distributed antenna systems where you've got, you know, a slew of 700 megahertz system, you've got 850 megahertz system, and typically 1900 uh, megahertz uh, systems to cover um, uh, LTE, to cover 3G and, uh, you know, PCS, and, uh, and, and, you know, just the different cellular bands that are common in the U.S., I'd like to see how and understand how that works. And is there any of that technology that, well, and, and they also have Wi-Fi. So you got the 2.4 gig going on as well when you have distributed Wi-Fi over an area. Um, I'd, I'd like to see how, that, how they've miniaturized that tech, how they've made it work in what seems like a very, very complicated uh, setup. What do you know about that? Well, I, I did look that up recently because I was working on a project that involved flat panel antennas for 5.8 gig for a uh, STL link. And the fractal and the technology used in the active antenna systems in the flat panels is what they use for developing the diplexes and duplexes and miniaturizing. So it's basically uh, utilizing substrates and, and uh, uh, substrates and, and, and fractal antenna design, which basically uses mathematics to use harmonic energy, harmonic frequencies, and multiples of, and to to combine and create losses or gains depending on how they cut the substrate. I'm I still have a lot of information. I'm still trying to find a way to explain it easily without having to say, you know, go look at this reference on your Wikipedia or whatever. But it's pretty wild what they can do. And they do it in the phone. I've taken apart little data modems, and you can look at the fractal antenna. And if, you, it's a, if you think of a printed circuit board, flexible printed circuit board, that's what it's a cutout, and they just wrap it around a, a non, an insulating material, and that's the antenna. It's literally, you know, like an eighth of an inch in length or maybe a half an inch, depending on the frequency it's operating at. It's pretty wild what they can do. And in the cellular world, unlike sometimes in broadcast, their noise floor, their level of where they need to make things work, is starts at around 100, uh, minus 130 dBm. That's, that's a good level. That's where they want to be operating Whoa. and make things work. So wow. passive intermodulation is, is critical to them. So if they have interference coming in at, at 120, 110, minus that is, minus 110, 120, their systems are in trouble. Also, mm -hmm. wireless systems and the design for distributed antenna as well, if they have a 1 to 3 dB loss in their link budget, no good. It's, it's, they, they're losing money. So you're talking link budget losses of less than a dB is normal. So just picture the type of antenna designs that are required and, and all the systems involved. It's fascinating, some of the stuff that goes on. And it makes it possible for your cell phone to operate, you know, you know it, it, you're talking, yeah, 130, minus 130 dBm to operate. If you're two-way radio for ham operations or other stuff, you're talking, what, minus, uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.3 microvolt sensitivity, 0 0.15, 
that's around 110, minus 10, 110 dB, 115. And if you can make that work really well through your duplex or antenna system, you're, you're in great shape. We're talking yeah. minus 130 as a, as a norm. <laughs> Yeah, so so we, you know, what's brought this about is consumer demand, I suppose. People expect to, what, to hold this little device and they expect for it to work all over town, inside hotel rooms, out by the pool. Uh, you know, you almost expect, you're disappointed when it doesn't work in the elevator, even though it <laughs> probably shouldn't work in a Faraday cage. And so uh, the cellular industry apparently has really, you know, uh, worked hard to raise the bar, or as I said, perhaps lower the bar, uh, to get the noise floor so far down that signals can be used even when they're 125 dB, dBm, dBv, when they're low. DBM, DBM, yeah. Yeah, that, that is just amazing. I, I wonder how that kind of tech would end up helping broadcasters, and I have at least one answer already, and that's, you know, the project that I had worked on installing a couple of uh, Ubiquiti brand IP radios uh, it amazes me their performance. Now, we are getting a signal level of about minus 70 dBm uh, at each dish, uh, at, in each direction, and, and it's working quite well. I don't know how much lower it would go before it quit working. Probably, I probably have a good 20 dB of fade margin there. But wouldn't you expect that this kind of tech in the cell industry to eventually, you know, to find its way into the broadcast industry? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and it, and it has. It has in, in, in the case of 5.8 gig uh, wireless gear. That's exactly what's being used, uh, and in, in antenna design too. I mean, you can, if you want to get real crazy and you're doing some 5.8 work, you can go out and purchase some nice sectorized antennas. They're usually you know four foot, two foot, or eight foot in height, and they're designed in such a way that you can get a nice 180 degree, 120 degree, or 90 degree beam width, and and create your own little uh, wireless. You know, directional network. Say your offices or your your facility is set up across the street from a park or a place that you do a lot of uh, outdoor broadcasts from, and you have access to the outside of your building. You can sectorize your 5.8 right toward that and focus a beam. You know, beam forming uh, your antenna, your signal to that location, and you can go out there on a whim. You know, you don't have to have a crazy antenna set up and just go out and, and do things. Uh, you could actually do maybe do regular remote broadcasts from a venue. You could roll out a two-foot sector antenna and set yourself up and be you know, relatively guaranteed that as long as your guys stay within the beam width of that sectorized antenna, you're off to the races. So you know, it's, it's taking what we, what we would use for an RPU or a Marty antenna back in the UHF days or VHF or the Yagi, okay? And then you'd point that Yagi toward wherever your guy is with the wireless gear. Same thing, same principles now with 5.8 with even more uh, accuracy and, and flexibility. Very interesting. I can think of so many, boy, possibilities. And I do want to talk. Today. We're going to take another break here shortly. But I want to talk about. Um, so you know, some broadcasters are still using uh, the RPU bands, typically using Marty brand equipment, maybe others at this point to do live remote broadcasts. And it seems like for a for a good fifteen years or so, it was tough to use some of those bands, especially in big cities because there was so much interference. Uh, other stations, you know, doing broadcasts, especially at popular times, you know, Friday afternoons or Saturday mornings, people doing live broadcasts. Where, and, and now we have so much IP technology making, uh, making it available to do broadcasts that way. Is that lightening the load on the RPU bands? Does that, does that bring up the possibility of going back to, to some of that, to some of the old analog gear? We'll talk about that in just a minute. Our show, This Week in Radio Tech, episode 295 is brought to you in part by the folks at Telos and the, uh, the new brand, the Zipstream brand of IP encoders. These are streaming encoders. You know, we have a slogan there, which is uh, stream like you mean it. And what does that mean, stream like you mean it? Well, there are so many broadcasters, and hey, I certainly have been one of them, that, yeah, we got a stream on the Internet. Yeah, it sounds okay. Uh, do we have metadata? Nah, maybe not. Uh, you know, is the it, it, if it's off the air for a day, did we know about it? Eh, maybe we didn't. But you know what? Streaming is getting to be where people are getting their radio stations to a larger and larger degree. Half of the population in the U.S. now is listening to streaming at least once a month and a pretty significant portion once a week. And a lot of people are listening to streaming absolutely daily. And hey, maybe, are you a broadcast engineer at a station? If your stream, if you're streaming now, if your stream goes down, do you get some phone calls? We do. 
Even at our little radio stations in Greenville, Mississippi, if, our st- if a stream goes down, we hear about it. We have uh, listeners, people who have offices maybe in a metal building somewhere. They can't hear our usual FM broadcast. They might be out of market, but surprisingly, usually they're in market. So the point there is you got to stream like you mean it. It's becoming more and more important. At some point, at some point, streaming will probably be more important than your transmitter, your over-the-air transmitter. Well, if you want to stream like you mean it, you got to do a couple things. Number one, you've got to have great audio processing so that stream sounds good. I don't necessarily mean loud. Loud ain't where it's at with streaming, but consistent quality and getting the audio to be friendly to the codec, that's important. Because with codecs, hey, you're wiping out a ton of the, of the audio data, and you're left with just a little bit of data to describe the audio, especially at the lower bit rates. So you want to use a, uh, an audio processor that is designed for and friendly to streaming. Don't use your old FM processor. Don't just grab something uh, off the shelf at, at Best Buy and try to use that as your audio processor for your stream. You know what I'm talking about. Or at Guitar Center, you want to use a processor that is absolutely made for streaming. And here's the cool thing. Every streaming product from Zipstream comes with an audio processor. Everything comes with at least the Omnia 3-band uh, uh, audio processing. This is the same technology that went into the Omnia3.net, and it is terrific technology. It was when we designed it, and it is still today now, including a look-ahead limiter that's very intelligent. It actually predicts intermod distortion and mitigates it before it happens. So the audio processing is key. The second part, though, is to use uh, audio encoding that is the real stuff. It's not knockoff. It's not some code that works with an MP3 or an AAC decoder. It's actual reference code. And every product from Telos, from the Zipstream line, uses reference code, reference libraries that are bought and paid for from the folks who developed it, uh, typically at Fraunhofer. That's where most of it goes. So when you do streaming, stream like you mean it. And then when you add the other things in, the metadata, well, in the Zipstream products, there's a very powerful metadata engine. It can ingest metadata from just about any source out there, any automation, uh, any middleware program like, uh, uh, like CSRDS, Center Stage RDS, uh, or others, and take that metadata, parse it correctly, parse it the way you want it to, and present that on your stream. And uh, it uses a, a very cool uh, Lua scripting engine inside the metadata parser uh, in the Zipstream products. And hey, it kind of sounds complicated to set up, but guess what? If you don't, if it doesn't have a preset for your system, Telos includes a program to capture the incoming metadata from your automation system. You send that to the folks at Telos, and they will write a script for it. Install that script back in your uh, in your Zipstream software, and bam, you've got perfect data going out. Maybe your whole program, your whole uh, music library is in all uppercase letters. Do you want that on your stream? Maybe you'd rather have mixed case so it looks better. Well, the, the engine that's included with the Zipstream can do that for you. Turn all uppercase into mixed case so it looks better. So a lot of possibilities uh, right there. Lots of remote control possibilities too and the ability to send the stream once you've created streams in MP3 or AAC or H-E-A-A-C, once you've created those streams, you can send them out to virtually any kind of streaming server on the planet. They have uh, presets for all these different types of streaming servers, RTMP, Wowza, Flash servers, uh, Apple, uh, HLS. Uh, I mentioned Wowza already, of course, Icecast and Shoutcast as well. Check it out. Go to telosalliance.com. Look for Zipstream and check out all the different Zipstream products out there. Two different hardware platforms, the R1, and they are two, and uh, two or more different software platforms, the uh, Zipstream AXE. There's also the file-based processor, the Zipstream FXE, and then there's the Zipstream X2 and the 9X2, really powerful software and hardware for streaming like you mean it. You're watching This Week in Radio Tech, episode 295. I'm Kirk Harnack. I'm on vacation, but taking a few minutes off of vacation to spend time with you and with Chris Tobin in New York. Chris, uh, welcome back. We're talking about uh, indoor distributed antenna systems and outdoor distributed antenna systems. Chris, what, uh, what do you want to pivot to now? What do you think is uh, the next subject to cover with these antenna systems? 
Well, I just want to show the three images just so I can follow up with everything we've been talking about. And I was just going through yeah. some notes. And the noise floor measurements, they start for testing passive intermodulation or PIM testing, which is critical in, in the wireless world and in cellular wireless and other systems. Um, p passive intermodulation has become a real, real problem. And we can get into that in another show. Uh, I've actually worked on two projects that we... Uh, with the Department of Commerce regarding uh, inter intermodulation issues and public safety. So uh, it's a pretty wild uh, uh, to topic. But um, just to show, the, uh, we'll go with the first picture of Suncast. We'll get the TWERT uh, ODAS 001. There we go. Um, that there is a uh, simple tripod with a 20-foot uh, mast, uh, two 10-foot sections. At the very top is a uh, multi-band antenna. It's, it's an omnidirectional. It's operating at 700 megahertz and 21 megahertz. It's the set of frequencies. So that just shows you what the setup is. It's on a street, sidewalk in the street here in Newark, New Jersey. And then if you go to number two, uh, the, the picture number two, next one. Nope, not that there. You don't have to show that. That's correct. That's good. Let's go to a twerk uh, <laughs> ODAS number 002. And this is what you see at the bottom of the tripod. And what it is, and there you go. At the bottom of the tripod are car batteries because they're powering the transmitter. It's a small 20-watt transmitter. And then there's a diplexer in that picture as well. It's kind of tough to see, but it's a little silver box inside the tripod legs. And that diplexer is taking the two radio frequencies, the uplink and downlink, combining them together, putting it up onto the mast, onto the antenna. So now what's happening is... They transmit a signal. It's a carrier wave. It's a C CW wave. It's a single tone. It's just, it's just, that's what it is. And now there's a car driving around the city in a predetermined map structure and measuring the RF signal. So as you know, you receive a signal. It could be minus 70, minus 80, minus 120 dBm. It just goes and they map it using GPS as well as a mapping program to determine where the highs and lows are, what the shadows would be, and what to expect. And then from there, the RF engineers for the particular wireless company will go back and determine and figure out what type of antennas and transmitter power is needed to create cells within this area. And it's a pretty wild process. It takes several months. I was talking to the gentleman. It takes several months to do it. They, they have a whole methodology to it. They had just come back from doing the same thing in New York City, which is even more difficult because you can't really stop the car everywhere you want to tweak your measurements. So they do drive it, and they have programs that just automatically do markers, you know, like little waypoints on the, on the software. It says, here we are. Here's the signal. Here's the signal. And they just keep driving because you can imagine a major city. You can't just stop in the middle of an avenue and, and pop out an antenna and start moving around outside a car. So that, that's part of what's going on. So I just wanted to show those pictures. Of, that's what, if you ever see that set up somewhere on the street that you're driving around, that's somebody doing a uh, distributed antenna system testing and making uh, RF measurements. Uh, just as an Chris, RF, um, just as a so what, what, kind of, what kind of company would be doing that kind of work? Is that the cell company itself and their engineers? Or is well, it, no, it third-party it no, consulting? It's, it's a third party. It's a third party. The, the, cell, en the cell engineers don't go out and do it. They do certain cursory type, that I was told. Uh, Crown Castle is one of the large companies people are probably familiar with because they do a lot of stadium work. Uh, Crown mm -hmm. Castle, and there's another company, I can't think of the name of it. That they, that's what they do. They, 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 uh, they go out, they get hired by the wireless companies to map out, and give them a complete you know, three-dimensional RF map of, of the area, and then they figure out from the carrier side, the wireless carrier then looks at their network topology and what they require for their specifications to meet the user experience that they want or the quality of experience as it's known, and then they put the two together, and, that, and that's how it works. It's, it's pretty cool. I mean, I sat and talked to this guy. We talked for about two hours, and, and, and the stuff he told me, the things they did and how they do it, it just made me you know, realize and appreciate you know, all the stuff I've done in ham radio and FM and AM broadcast, it's like, wow, I'm just touching the surface. These guys are talking minus 140 dBm noise floor. It's like, just think of the noise and what you have to work with at that level. It's pretty cool. It's, it's pretty wild. Aren't there um, sources of man-made noise that, that would impinge upon the cleanliness? Or in the bands that they're using, do we yet have to find much man-made noise? Oh, yeah, there's, there's plenty of noise to be had. And, and part of the process, and I was just reading up on this the other night, I mean, the filtering that goes on, the, 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 the methods of shaping the RF into the IF sections of the radios, the, the phones, uh, there's so much that goes on that creates the, the necessary you know, shape of the receivers, the received signal, even the transmit. I mean, uh, you know, in 700 meg, 2100 meg, 1900 megahertz uh, frequencies where all the cell sites, all cell carriers are operating, there's a lot of man-made noise and, and a lot of it can be filtered out. And there's, a lot of the noise just comes from their own systems. 
You know, that's where the passive intermodulation. When you start putting together several transmitters in one site, we all know what happens there. If you're a master antenna, you know, master FM antenna system, you 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 understand what's involved in filtering and in, in, in the combiner systems. Picture the same thing operating at minus 140 dBm, and you you're talking you know several watts at, at 700 megahertz into a combining system that's the size of a shoebox, and you sit there going, wow. And then you have to distribute those antennas all around your literally around where you are. You know, unlike a master antenna system where it's just up on a mast, it's one big antenna, and off it goes. You're talking antennas that are around you. You're, you're filling this space with the RF that you're, you know, you're operating in. You know, th this helps me understand better why, uh, why Verizon was having such a problem at some FM transmitter sites with, uh, what was it, 11th harmonic of some yes. radio frequencies were falling into the 900 megahertz area. Um, that Verizon needed to be clean, and this is where we get into a world where, hey, this FM transmitter is operating perfectly legally. There's nothing illegal. It's it's fully within the FCC spec uh, when it was approved, and yet it's creating a problem for another user that didn't exist when this when the transmitter was checked out and approved. Right. Now, remember, what we're talking about is, you know, intermodulation, right? You're talking second, third, fourth, 11 harmonic energy. So any of us as broadcast engineers know, and you do this for AM and for FM, but we'll go with FM at the moment. So the LTE band happens to be at 700 megahertz as well as it's now being available at 1900 and 2100. But 700 megahertz is AT&T and, and, and Verizon right now. So the 11th harmonic of several FM channels falls in that band. However, mm -hmm. it falls in at that band according to our specifications and noise flood concerns at around, for us, anything, what is it, minus 80? Is that right? 82? 80, whatever, minus 60, uh, 80, I think it is. Anything yeah. outside of that, we're legal. We're talking, yeah. about, we're talking about a service, a radio service that operates at a minus 140. So we're coming in at minus 80. We're blasting them. Think about it. You're blasting, <laughs> yes. Do yes. the math. That's you're like, yeah. So, so you're, you're, you're Verizon. You've got this, this sectorized antenna receiving system on top of a building or a tower that's used to pick up cell phones that are microwatts. And, we're, you know, we're talking 100, 100 dB down. And then all of a sudden you have this one carrier that's at 80, minus 80. Guess what? You flood the, you, you, you've swamped them. It's just, you know, it's like the same principles we experience in an FM receiver in blanketing interference near an FM tower. Same principle. Wow. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's a whole new dynamic. It's it's you know, it's just opening up all kinds of things. As a matter of fact, at NAB, at the PREC Public Radio Engineering Conference, uh, Michael Eclair and a few others will be talking about LTE interference issues and what FM broadcasters can expect. So I have to throw that in there because it's a, it's relevant. Yeah, I'd be eager to hear that. I'm actually speaking at the PREC about uh, well, about streaming, about uh, adaptive multi-rate streaming. So I'll be eager to sit out. I love to hear Michael Clare talk. He does great talks. So I'll, I'll love to hear uh, the, what we can about that and find out how do you bridge this gap, this what could be a 60 dB gap between yeah. legal and, and useful. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Wow. Yeah, I'll, I'll be at the conference also, so we'll, we'll catch up. But the, yeah, my, when Michael talks about something, a good sound of topic, he goes into it in a nice practical manner, and it's, it's well worth the uh, uh, attendance, and, and if not attending, at least reading about it after the fact. Also, I meant to mention earlier when you were talking about the technology and how do broadcasters benefit, uh, broadcasters, in the case of television, can benefit from LTE technology, right, long-term ev evolution, because it's now available for them to use in their BAS channels, the broadcast auxiliary service, the uh, okay. 7 gigahertz and, and 5 gigahertz channels they use for ENG, right? Yeah, there are companies yeah. who actually are building, have built equipment that you can apply, use on that frequency, and create your own LTE network. I won't go into detail because you'll have to look it up, but I, I was at the NAB, was it two years ago, talking to a company that actually talked about it, and I was like, wait a minute, let me get this straight. So I could take my 7 gig frequencies I'm licensed to, put these little transmitters, nodes up, and I can create my own little network similar to a cell network and do what I know to do in all data, and it's LTE. And they said, yeah, absolutely. I was like, think about it. You're a TV broadcaster in an urban center, and you're relying on LTE cell phones at a major breaking story, and local law enforcement decide to shut down the, ch the cellular channels. You've lost communication. Mm. But yeah. if you're using this LTE product on your licensed 7 gigahertz stuff, guess what? You're still talking to the newsroom. You're still making connections. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, there you see the wheels are turning. So Yeah. And if you're an F FM and AM station that's partnered with a TV station, say you're co-owned, mm -hmm. co 
maybe you're not co-owned. Maybe you have a business relationship with the TV station for programming, for content material. And they decide maybe they're going to go into this LTE technology concept. You buy into it. Maybe you pool your resources. Now you can piggyback on their data stream. What does that do for you? Oh, that's right. It's data. Guess what? That little zip codec can be on the other end. You could be doing a broadcast. Sure. In a yeah. frequency that's licensed, you control. And you're not worried about some internet connection at a sports bar that you can't control. Again, I'm just speaking out loud. This is just, you got to think about this. Look at the box and go outside. But think about it. You can do LTE on licensed frequencies you manage and operate. There is a capital investment, but in the long term, what do you get out of it? Either you rely on your own resources to get the job done or you rely on the phone company. Which is it going to be? So, Chris, I, I, I guess I'm, I, we've gotten off track every time I've asked you about the New York City subway system. Um, I'm not sure if you alerted me to this first or if I was – at a subway platform and, and saw this myself, but I see quite a few platforms that have three antennas on yes. a little uh, hanging down thing, and I'm guessing that um, this is making my wireless experience actually work. Um, I think I read that uh, the four major carriers are involved, what Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, and T-Mobile. Yes. And then I also read something about Wi-Fi. Maybe Boingo Wireless uh, was involved as well. So... What, what can I expect if I'm in a subway station in New York, and how does that work? Those are uh, custom-made antennas. I can't think of the name of the company. I just looked it up the other day, and I saw the picture of it, and they were promoting it. They're custom-made. They're designed to distribute the RF. Yes, they do cellular, cellular frequencies, and they're doing uh, 2.4 gig. And they're also building into that network uh, public safety uh, Wi-Fi channels. I think that's, that's 4.9 gigahertz. And I'm just looking at my pictures. I have some paperwork on the, uh, the way it's designed. And the, it's basically they, have, they use fiber throughout the plant. So you'll see uh, the fiber and a Hyberflex cable from RFS systems. And uh, it combines fiber and RF cables in one, in one uh, jacket. And that's, that's what they're doing. They're basically the RF combining it and then sending it out. And that's what you see. Yes, they, they extend down from the ceiling. You'll see them in the stairwells uh, on the escalators. There'll be one or two if they have to fill in a space. And you'll see them at the entrance to many of the subway uh, system uh, platforms. So the, the, the Wi-Fi, now, if that's Boingo Wireless, that means I, I need to be a customer of Boingo f to use that, right? Uh, I think so, but I've used my wireless a couple of times on the subway, and I don't remember getting prompted... To, to log into anything. Now, I'm not sure why. Oh. That could, they could okay. be testing other stuff. There, there's been a lot of talk about changing what type of Wi-Fi access, how they're doing it because of the New York City link, which is the above-ground municipal Wi-Fi system that just went online. And um, so there, there's a lot of changes going on. But on most, subway system, most subway stations, I think there's 200 of them they were able to do right now, or 200 plus. You can pretty much get connectivity outside you know, from underground. Yeah, I read uh, 277 uh, subway stations, and they, they started out with 30 or 40 to, to get going, and they're building out the rest of them now. So it, this technology, are, is there a central location they're serving all this from, or does each location have, and I learned a new word today, does each location have a donor antenna that's outside that picks up the various services and brings them inside with bi-amplification? Uh, no, they, um, to the best of my knowledge, they're not doing the donor antenna system for the cellular stuff. They do donor antennas for their public safety communications on the other frequencies, but not this. Uh. What they do is they've built base station hotels or the head end, and that's brought in by fiber. So fiber comes in from outside, and that okay. brings in the broadband services, cellular services, and then they put that through various, um, Cabling and uh, what do they call them? RANs. They're radio access network boxes. And then there's the base station units, the BRUs, uh, base remote units, and, and that's distributed throughout the system. And that's that's what they're doing. So the, the base station hotels could be at several stations, could be one location distributed out, and then say somewhere else another one is set up. So it, it's it's distributed across. It's it's not just one place and everything comes out of. So would they ever have a situation where? you had a, a leaky coax in the subway tunnel itself and, and you would have cell service the whole time that you're on the train because you do get cell service in the stations and a little bit of distance either way but you can be in the middle of a run and have no service any idea about that 
Well, there was talk of using um, the leaky Colorax approach in the tunnels itself, but I think that became a logistics uh, nightmare. I, 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 uh. Part of the problem is when you're dealing with the New York City subway system, bear in mind that it's 24-7. Uh, there's a lot going on and disrupting service to do these kinds of things uh, doesn't always go well with with the ridership because you know at three o'clock in the morning you could be on a very crowded train so you know it, it's it, that's part of the problem but logistically you're talking tunnels that you know it just is a lot going on so I think they just right now it's platform access you see the antennas that's why they're doing it that way and then I'm sure down the road somewhere things will change and maybe like phase five if you get to that they may be using the leaky coax inside the tunnels itself I'm guessing that a uh high voltage rated capacitor to the cell network connected to the third rail that's not really an option is it <laughs> no that 600 volts will not do you any good make a night light oh. show that's about it oh okay well because the third <laughs> rail already goes everywhere so i thought maybe they could just use that do a carrier current and, yeah that'd be nice and hey it's insulated oh that it is although i guess it does get some draw whenever a train goes by oh yeah Eh, just a few amps, that's all. <laughs> wow. So, um, Chris, uh, we're going to uh, break for our sponsor. When we come back, let's think about where this tech is going. And uh, as broadcast engineers, you know, what should we be looking for for benefits from uh, indoor distributed antenna systems and outdoor distributed antenna systems? How can this help a broadcast engineer doing, say, live remote broadcast from a stadium uh, or from a convention center? Uh, you know, we've got uh, what the political conventions are coming up, and I will just bet you that the convention centers that they're in are either have now or are getting installed some pretty sophisticated uh, distributed antenna systems. If they're if they're not, they need to be. Uh, saw I saw a great write up on the a big one in Tampa that was uh, actually uh, set up for the 2012. I think it was the Republican convention in Tampa in 2012. They had a pretty sophisticated system set up for that. So let's think about uh, direct benefits to broadcast engineers. And uh, in the meantime, uh, let's talk about our sponsor, Axia, and the Axia Radius Console. Now, this very podcast you're listening to is coming through a Radius Console. By the way, if you hear some bad audio, hey, remember, I'm in Cancun. I'm on, <laughs> I'm on a Wi-Fi setup. It's amazing the high quality audio that the radius console will actually do when you give it good audio. Uh, it does automatic mix minus and believe me the folks at this podcast network and other podcast networks really need that that service that functionality all the time. If you bring guests in by phone, by codec, by Skype, however you bring them in, um, mix minus is critical. And Mix Minus has been the bane of board operators for years because it's, it's a little complicated. It's easy to forget just what it is you're trying to do. And automatic Mix Minus built into all of the Axia consoles makes life so easy and makes these broadcasts uh, occur so, so fantastically and easily. Hey, every time we do a show, if I'm at my home studio, you know, where I've got great bandwidth, or even on the road like here in Cancun, um, I always hear Chris Tobin, always. I always hear Suncast, who is you know, giving us some direction on, on the show, or if we need to break, or if, hey, my audio is bad because my, my mic is wonky. Uh, that mix minus is absolutely critical, and so many broadcasters use it as well. It's just one of the little features that you can do in a console like the Radius console from Axia. I have seen, just in, in the past week, I've seen at least a half dozen new Radius console installations, pictures from these installations. Uh, Facebook is, is a great place to go look for those. In fact, if you're not a member of the group, you ought to check it out on Facebook. I take pictures of Radio Studios, and you will see some fantastic ideas for Radio Studios and lots of pictures of uh, Axia consoles as well. Now, uh, at my little radio stations in American Samoa, we've got Radius consoles. They were quick to install, really fast. I mean, literally a matter of a couple of hours to get them in and on the air. And I spent a little bit more time tweaking a few extra tweaks that are in there. And even when I got home from American Samoa, a couple of things I forgot to do, or maybe the disc jockey wants a little bit different EQ on his microphone, so I can do that remotely. Uh, because you can access the console remotely and you can save the way, the way the console is now, make a couple of changes, see if that works right for them, 
it's all so easy to do when your console is uh, audio over IP and IP connected. The Radius console, um, typically you buy the Radius console with uh, a smaller mixing engine called the Core 16. The Core 16 comes with uh, two mic inputs. Uh, it's got, I think, about 10 uh, line inputs and line outputs. It's also got one AES digital input and output. And uh, it's got some GPIO built into it as well, four GPIO ports. Uh, each one has five inputs and five outputs. Plus, it's networked. And being networked, there's a switch, an Ethernet switch built right into the console. So you can add accessories to it right there. If you need to add a, a Telos uh, digital phone, no problem. Just plug it right in. Power over Ethernet is even offered as well on this Ethernet switch. So just plug the phone right in. You got power, you got Ethernet, and you just program the IP address in the phone, and bam, you're off to the races with the phone. That's how we do it at my radio stations. That's how so many people around the world are doing it with their radio stations. The Radius console, it's a heck of a good value. It's audio over IP. In fact, it's a great way to put your foot in the door, to get your feet wet, if you will, with audio over IP is the Radius console. And remember, once you've got an Axia AOIP uh, network going at your radio station, it opens up a lot of possibilities, like for the things that Chris and I talk about, doing easy remotes with audio over IP, maybe making an STL to your transmitter site with an inexpensive IP radio like I've done at my radio stations. It really opens the door to a lot of possibilities. Check it out on the interwebs at uh, telosalab. Dot com. That's telosalliance.com, and look for Axia, and look for the Radius IP audio console. All right, Chris Tobin, tell me a little bit yes. about the future and, and, and why, uh, why IDAS and ODAS uh, are something that I should learn about and as a broadcast engineer be excited about. Well, <clears throat> definitely learn about the technologies and how it's going about because it's going to impact your, your use of wireless uh, cellular phones for just personal and business, and as far as broadcast for remotes or you know outside remotes and jet revenue generation, the more you learn about what your city or locale has for distributed antenna systems on the cellular network side, it gives you a better opportunity to try and find ways to do those broadcasts in a more reliable manner. Now we all know we've gone out and done stuff that just you know we claim one thing and find another, or you know we just say we'll take a laptop Wi-Fi and go for it and wing it. Once you understand how these systems are designed, what they can do. You can actually go out and test it and, and come up with your own metrics and go, okay, you know where your parameters are. You, know, you pretty much create your, your limits. And once you've done that, you can do reliable broadcasts more often than once or twice. Uh, I can say this because I've personally done it on many occasions. I've worked with a uh, sports internet network where we've done four different broadcasts for the NHL, and I did all of them using Verizon uh, data modem. And I mapped out where the, uh, the DAS was at two locations, and I happened to notice one being used on an outdoor, event, uh, outdoor location, and every one of them worked. And there was two-hour shows, and they went back to a major network that was on a satellite channel that mm. went across the country. So you can do it, but it does require some footwork and uh, understanding. So learn about DAS in general, and then learn about the in and outdoor stuff. But indoor stuff is great. Um, you know, oh, that was the picture I meant to show, and I didn't show it. Darn it was the DAS antenna inside an a, a office uh, operation. Well, I don't know if, uh, if uh, there's any chance to get that picture up while we're chatting here in our number last three. couple of minutes. That'd be, that'd be great. Oh, number three. If it's, it's available, we'll three. chat about it as soon as it, soon as it pops up. So, yeah. Chris, when you're approaching a event, when you're thinking about doing a broadcast from a given venue, okay, there it is. Tell us what we're looking at there. Okay, so this is um, at a transmitter facility in New York City. It's in an office building, rooftop. And it's part of a distributed antenna system for Verizon, AT&T, and Sprint. And that is a, a DAS antenna. That's a, a, a ceiling mount. You typically would have ceiling tiles above it. This happens to be the open space in the combiner room. But just showing you, that's what the antenna is. So if I stood beneath this antenna or within, say, 50 feet of it with my data modem for Verizon, I can connect to the broadband and do whatever I'd like to do and probably get the full bandwidth of what they're offering through the LTE connection. And then the best part is... I'm so close that I'm the most powerful signal. So even if there's somebody on the same floor as I am using their cell phone to talk to Verizon, I'm already in. My resource blocks are being assigned to me, and I've got what I need. So once you take that into account, you can now tailor how you do stuff. Take that same example. That antenna is the same one that I used for a broadcast I did from the rooftop of that building last year when I extended my USB cable several, several feet from outside down the stairwell to that antenna. 
And that's how I was able to do a full hour from the rooftop of a building in Manhattan and not be interrupted. And I was on wireless uh, LTE. Well, we're about done. And, and, and what I want to ask you, Chris, was if you know you're going to be doing a broadcast in a location that you suspect might have a distributed antenna system, what kind of, what kind of office, what kind of person at that location might you talk to? Or, or do, you, do you need to talk to anybody? Do you need any special anything? Or you just go in and use your, your cellular gear, your, your, your data modems, and, and expect them to work better? Well, you, you don't need anything special. It's, it's meant to be uh, ubiquitous so that any end user just comes in and uses their cell phone accordingly or data modem. But if you have the, the luxury of, of meeting somebody at the building, you sometimes go to the building engineer and ask them about their antenna system for their, the wireless, for the cellular. They may either tell you, no, we don't manage it ourselves, or we have a company we deal with, and they can give you the name of a contact. You can just reach out to them and ask them about any restrictions or parameters that they implemented with that particular DAS in the building. Uh, maybe this, uh, the, the carrier hotel restrictions are they, they only do a certain amount of bandwidth. Maybe maybe only one carrier is accessible, not all of them. Uh, you know, things uh, like that. But no. you do a site survey. Yeah. So you go out and check. And the nice thing is if you do one of those uh, USB modems, uh, data modems, Use the diagnostics on them. I mean, look at the signal strength. Look at the bit error rate. You know, take a look at those little features and, and see what's going on. If it's a DAS system that's doing Wi-Fi, same thing. You know, look at the Wi-Fi specifications. Get the software you can get offline. There's plenty of open source stuff that lets you look at the, the parameters of your RF signal. And, and map it out. Look at it and see what the spectrum looks like. Go, oh, okay. And you'll know right away where things stand. And if you don't, you can learn it. It's not that difficult to understand. And once you get that going, you, you know, you're off to the races. You can make, make things happen. Chris, you and I both have been going to NAB for a long time. We're pretty familiar with the Las Vegas Convention Center. You remember the days when they would put up, uh, you know, those extra cell towers uh, outside the building, right, to try to cover the people who are inside the building. But that presents a whole bunch of challenges, like just getting through the walls of the building. And I noticed that one year, it all got a lot better. Not perfect, but it got a lot better. And I looked around and started seeing a whole lot of antennas inside the convention hall. I guess I yes. got to believe that Las Vegas Convention Center was a, a place where maybe, maybe put in by the cell companies, I don't know, but there was distributed antennas in there pretty early on. Yes, if you look on the walls uh, of the convention center, you'll see the large sectorized antennas. They're usually the ones they had last year. I, th I think I, they look like the four-foot type. And they're four-foot yeah. with four-ports antennas. So they, they have um, four-way antenna systems in them. So it's a, it's a MIMO system with a two-by-two. So they definitely uh, have improved systems completely. As far as the Wi-Fi is concerned, it's still the local contract, whoever has got it. I think it's Cox. Uh, Cox yeah. Cable has it. Yeah. So, uh, Cox Communications. But, yeah, oh, yeah, they've improved it considerably. I've, I've used my uh, LTE data modem a couple of times at uh, the NAB show, and it worked very well. Well, good deal. Chris, thanks so much for being with us and helping to educate us on uh, making me aware. I just, you know, I, this what didn't even cross my awareness until you brought it up. IDAS, ODAS, or just DAS in general. You can see a little bit more about this. Uh, they, hey, there's videos on YouTube that uh, describe how these systems work in more detail. A lot of them are company-centric. There'll be a particular company talking about their installation at this location or that location, but there's still education to be had there for broadcast engineers on YouTube and on Wikipedia, and uh, there's some forums as well uh, for learning about this kind of thing. Hey, uh, thanks to our sponsors, uh, Lavo and the Lavo Crystal Clear Console. Also, Telos and the Zipstream range of streaming encoders and processors. Stream like you mean it. And also by Axia and the Axia Radius Audio Console. Uh, Chris Tobin, thanks very much for joining us. I uh, appreciate you being there and putting up with uh, my poor connection from Cancun. That's quite all right. We'll, we'll tolerate it because we know you'll be enjoying yourself after you've done the show. <laughs> yeah. I'll be back in the regular studio next week. We'll see you then. Thanks to Suncast for producing our show again this week and for his technical expertise and help me out here. I appreciate it very much. We'll talk to you. We'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye, everybody.